Welcome back to this week's episode of The Emily Show. And today we are back in the world of the Johnny Depp Amber Heard defamation trial. Why? Because this is the case that though there is a verdict, just will not end. Why? Because Amber Heard has not stopped talking about this case. And so here we are. I was not going to break down Amber Heard's interview on Dateline much, but as I watched the interview on Dateline, there were some very glaring changes from the main Dateline interview and the teaser clips that had been out on the internet. And while I understand context, no, while I understand that teaser clips are previews and not everything in the preview or the trailer ends up in the in the main piece, there are some mid-sentence changes that raised an eyebrow for me, and I really just want to know what you think. So we are going to go over what was put into the Dateline interview, what was left out of the Dateline interview, and then juxtaposed it to the Chrisleys who actually spoke about their recent conviction on their latest podcast episode to look at how you can talk about a case after a verdict and maybe do it in a more graceful way than Amber Heard is doing it now. But since we sometimes begin with a quote, we're just going to begin with a quote today. Savannah Guthrie said, are you brave? Are you reckless? Are you vindictive? Why did you want to do an interview? And that's where we're going to jump in with this episode because there is so much here. Is this media manipulation did Amber Heard's team contact NBC after the teasers dropped and said you had to change this? Did NBC decide to change it so that the Dateline episode was softer and more friendly to Amber Heard versus the teaser trailers? Was all of this just done to get clicks and views? I don't know. I want to know what you think. We're getting into it now. I have so many thoughts. Hey there. Welcome to The Emily Show. I'm your host, Emily D. Baker, badass lawyer and everyone's favorite legal commentator, breaking down the legal shit in the news and pop culture stories you want to talk about. I've been a licensed attorney for over 15 years. I'm a former prosecutor and I'm a big fan of the cursey words. So let's break it down. A huge thank you to today's sponsor, Casetify. Now, you are spending thousands for your phone, and if you are like me, it has become your world. I can work from my phone, I can amuse myself from my phone, I can stay in touch with the world, and TikTok trends, let's be perfectly honest. But I need my phone protected, and I want it to look cute, and that's where Casetify comes in. Not only do these cases use recycled materials, but they also have Tech technology that has drop protection up to 9.8 feet, definitely high enough if you know your cat knocks it off your desk or your kid drops it off the couch because they want to play games that they don't have on their iPad. It also has a plus and a minus the minus because it is decision fatiguing how many options there are literally endless options my mom and i were texting because she needs a new phone case and i said look i work with case defy i love these cases just here's the website here's my link go pick one and my mom texted back she's like how do you choose there's too many and then there's infinite options to customize them and i said well that is part of the fun so not only do you keep your phone safe but there are tons of customizable options and there is always something new. I love that you can add an iridescence to them and I've been using these cases for ages now and it doesn't scratch or chip or start to fade and degrade as you use the case as too many other types of cases do. So if you want to check it out for yourself and customize some awesome cases, no matter what kind of phone you use, just go to www.casetify.com slash Emily D to save 15% off your order. That's right. www.casetify.com slash Emily D for 15% off your order. Now let's get back into today's story. Before we get all the way into this Dateline episode, I think it'll be helpful to do a quick road so far of how we got here. No, I'm not going to road so far the whole trial. I'm going to just road so far post-verdict because post-verdict, NBC made a full-ass meal out of this interview. On June 13th, Monday, they teased on social media and on the Today Show 
that there was going to be an Amber Heard sit down interview. It was speculated that this was happening because um, paparazzi and media had caught Amber Heard taking a private jet or landing in a private jet at Teterboro Airport and then heading into New York. And people were like, oh, is she sitting down for an interview? And now when I go back and look at those reports and photos and look at this interview, it's like, okay, I think that that was probably when she recorded this. Fine. On June 14th, an eight to 10 minute clip. There were two longer eight to 10 minute clips that were released, one on June 14th and one on June 15th. And we're gonna go over some of those today because there were some substantial changes from those clips that were on the Today Show and then on the Today Show website, some substantial changes between those and the Dateline interview. And again, keeping information out is not a problem for me. Like, oh, there's more information. You've got to watch all this together to get the full story. The mid-sentence changes are strange for me. And then, and then, on June 16th, you get a peacock drop to drive people to their subscription service, paid paid subscription service through NBC. And then on the same day, a juror speaks out about this case. And I think the juror speaks out after seeing the clips, and I'm not surprised. Not only do we have clips of Amber Heard saying, how could the jury not be influenced? How could they not be influenced by social media? But you've also had Elaine Bredehoff going on, you know, multiple interviews saying the same thing. So the jurors have been questioned by not just Elaine, but now by a party to the litigation themselves, the losing party. So I'm not surprised that we got a juror speaking out saying that they weren't influenced by social media. And I broke down that entire juror statement in length, in length, <laughs> and detail and some sass and stark over on my YouTube channel at the Emily D Baker. If you want to see me breaking down that juror um, statement, I will reference parts of it today, but the full breakdown and all of my thoughts on it, I will link that in the show notes in the description. If you want to go check that out. Then on June 17th, you get the Dateline interview dropping on Friday. It's like a 40 minute ish interview and then commercial. So it was an hour long Dateline special. That started with that question, are you brave? Are you reckless? Are you vindictive? Why did you want to do an interview? And Amber Heard said, the one thing I'm not is vindictive and that her goal for the interview is for people to see her as a human being. And it's interesting because as we get into this interview, I think Amber Heard goes out of her way to paint Johnny Depp as a character and not a human being while asking for everyone to see her as human and we're going to play one of the clips of that in where it's kind of oddly funny and then there's other times where it's just really sad the kind of dehumanization that happens of johnny depp in this interview but there's other questions about this interview before we break it down more that i've seen being asked online through alternative media and if you've been following on social media on YouTube, you have seen that legacy media, traditional media, some, not all, some in legacy and traditional media have been coming for the alternative media coverage of this case. And as a legal commentator with this podcast and my YouTube channel, I consider myself alternative media. I am not a journalist, but I am a voice that is not beholden to a corporate media entity. My corporate media entity is me. And my team, who is who I run things by, but we are a we are a scrappy independent channel over here. So with that, it's been interesting to watch the conversation between legacy media coverage of this case and alternative media coverage of this case, and seeing at times the legacy media take shots at the alternative media. And while it's fair to ask a question about whether, you know, a TikTok creator who is you know, maybe not ever covered anything legal, just making, you know, fun of this case is actual news media coverage, but I don't think it is. I don't think that's news media coverage. Sometimes people do things for memes, for laughs, for clicks, for views, that's fine, but you can't lump all alternative media together. And I keep seeing a push to do that and be like, oh, well, some TikTokers memed this trial. Everyone memed this trial. It was very memed. But TikTokers memed this trial, therefore all alternative media voices were unfair, were motivated by money, were motivated by clicks and views. And that narrative is interesting in light of the fact that NBC took five days to kind of 
tinkle out this interview and then put it behind a paywall on Peacock. Yes, you could watch it on Dateline, but if you're trying to watch it online, it is paywalled on Peacock and you need to sign up for a subscription. So I think that legacy media seeking clicks and views is not any different than alternative media that is also reliant some on clicks and views. But I will say in articles that have been talking about YouTubers, myself included, getting super chats and community support, it's funny because it makes us less reliant on having to do things to draw in clicks because our community is like, no, we're here for you. So we don't have to sensationalize or clickbait things. We just have to say, hey, I'm talking about this. And then our community is like, I want to hear you talk about this. So there's no need to put things behind a paywall because our community says, I would like to support you in this way. So it's funny to watch this get paywalled <laughs> when there's been so much talk about these YouTubers making money covering this trial. Uh, YouTubers make money doing lots of things. So it's been interesting to see. But the one thing that I found the most stunning was the mid-sentence edits that change context for me. And I want your thoughts on this as we continue on looking at those clips. And I'm going to break them down and play some of them back to back so that you can hear them for yourself. So Amber Heard said her whole goal here is for people to see her as human and then for people to see Johnny Depp. This is my editorial comment. And then for her to see Johnny Depp as a character and an actor and not actually a human. Interesting. She talks again about the First Amendment, which we saw in the clips. And when I broke those clips down on YouTube, I was talking about, you know, Amber Heard getting wrong this example and analogy that so many get wrong when talking about the First Amendment. But it frustrates me and possibly others. So she's talking about the First Amendment. I have a right to speak. I have a right to speak, you know truth to power, but the First Amendment doesn't protect everything because Savannah Guthrie questioned her and said, the First Amendment does not protect speech that amounts to defamation. And again, truth is a defense to defamation, which is why truth came up. And they talk about whether her statements were truthful. But she said, the First Amendment doesn't protect you from going into a crowded theater and yelling fire. This analogy comes from a case that has long since been overturned. And in that case, it was not the law. It was literally like an analogy. Yes, that's a reference to Real Housewives of New Jersey. It was an analogy, aka dicta, dicta being non-binding or non-governing parts of a case that are an example. And that case was overturned 40 years ago when the court really solidified what is inciting speech and what is unlawful inciting speech and imminent threats of violence different than just inflammatory speech or just hateful speech or just people being dicks. There's a difference. So this fire in a crowded theater analogy is a bad analogy. You all are law nerds and now you're like, hmm, that analogy is from a case that was overturned like over 40 years ago. It's not even a good analogy. Exactly. It's not even a good analogy. A better analogy would be something like making an imminent threat or an imminent call for violence, but you can't make those types of statements on television. So you can't even use it as an analogy. So the best analogy for this case is you can't defame someone because that's what a jury found that Amber Heard did and talking about defamation, not crowded theaters and yelling fire but she didn't. Amber Heard would like to be a constitutional law scholar in this interview. Then she gets into the op-ed and talking about the fact that the op-ed wasn't even about her relationship with Johnny Depp. Girl, what? She doubled back down on this op-ed wasn't about Johnny Depp. It was about a larger cultural conversation that was going on. And yes, there are parts of the op-ed about that, but the op-ed also is about two years ago, I became the face representing domestic abuse and I spoke up against sexual violence and paid the price. Those are also things in the op-ed. And when she testified about those things, she said the op-ed was about her relationship with Johnny Depp and other things. And then in her rebuttal, she was very angry about the randos that had come out of the wall to testify. And she said, this is why I wrote the op-ed, because people will just come out of the woodwork to support him. So she testified twice. 
that this op-ed was about Johnny Depp, but in her interview said that it wasn't. Now, for those that are inevitably going to ask me, isn't this perjury? No. She's not under oath with Savannah Guthrie. She's not under oath making this statement. It is another example of a contradictory statement from Amber Heard where she wants to try to put the shit back in the horse and be like, no, 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 the op-ed's not even about him. We heard your testimony. You said that it was. I'm going to rely on the testimony that was under oath and not the interview with Savannah Guthrie. When talking about her testimony, she also talked about the fact that the jury, you know, of naturally or of course decided this case before her side was heard. This is something that can be difficult in cases, but the party with the burden of proof goes first. So when Amber Heard was complaining about there being three weeks of evidence before hers, she should have been well prepared for that because that's how this works. The party with the burden of proof goes first, and the jury is told and admonished to not make up their mind until all evidence is heard, and it's something that can be difficult, but jurors take their job very seriously, and I think a lot of people want to hear the other side. Anyone who's naturally curious is like, okay, well, they said this, and then the next question is, but what did the other, what did the other side say? Oh my God, they said this, and then they said this, and then they said that. You want to hear all sides of the thing. And at least for me, I had the very special vantage point of having, you know, tens of thousands and on days, hundreds of thousands of people on with me live. And a lot of people wanted to hear what the other side of this case was and were waiting. But then after Amber Heard's testimony, we're having a much more difficult time keeping an open mind. It seemed like when she was done testifying, most people were done and were like, I this I'm done. This was where I made up my mind. Not when Johnny Depp's team was done after Amber Heard was done testifying. Then she gets into standing by her testimony, which I think is the biggest problem in this interview for Amber Heard. I think editing mid sentences is a problem for me with, with the choices that were made by NBC, but for Amber Heard, she gets into standing by her testimony and her accusations against Johnny Depp and says, of course, course. And I will till my dying day. I know what happened to me. I'm here as a survivor to my dying day. I will stand by every word of my testimony. There is room to see this as redefaming Johnny Depp by saying she not only stands by her accusations, but doubling down and saying, I know what happened to me. I'm here as a survivor. Now, this again goes to implications of domestic abuse. This again goes to implications of everything I said on the stand was true. The assault, the physical assault, the emotional abuse, the sexual assault, all of it. And I think that that statement is a large problem for her. If Johnny Depp's team wanted to sue her again, I don't know if they want to sue her again. I don't know if they should. I think this can be defamation per se. I think it would be a difficult fight. But I do think that Johnny Depp's team can try to seek a permanent injunction against Amber Heard. And I wonder if we will see that filed before sentencing happens on June 20, not sentencing. Emily, are you thinking of criminal cases? Yes. (laughs) Before judgment is entered on June 24th, because that's the next day in court. I wonder if we will see a filing Lord knows between the time I record this and the time that this goes live, that things can happen. And I will always put a note if they do. So that's why you should follow me on all platforms at the Emily D Baker. I'm just saying, because I will share it with you there. But that is the one thing that is hard with a podcast is there is, um, there is time between when I record and when things happen, could something happen between now and June 24th, where team Depp files for a permanent injunction to stop her from realleging the things that were found to be defamatory? Yes. Do I think they should? Yes. Will they choose to do that? We'll see. If they do, we'll see the filing and then we'll talk about it. But I do think they can get an injunction to stop her from realleging the things the jury found to be defamatory. And I think that that's a better plan than trying to sue her again over this interview. And it gets a court order that can then be enforced if she continues to violate it. And that starts becoming a violation of a court order not just another lawsuit. What is the point of suing Amber Heard again? Her lawyer has already gone on, you know, television to say she doesn't have the money to pay this. I believe that's one of the truer things that's been said here is that she doesn't have 
you know, $8 million out of pocket to pay Johnny Depp. So if she's in a position where she's becoming judgment proof, like go ahead and keep suing me. There's nothing left. Take it all. What are you going to do? There's no money here. Go for it. Then you get a position where Amber Heard as a party can just kind of wild out however she wants and is like, keep suing me. There's no money. Go for it. Have fun. You're never going to enforce this judgment. A court order, though, can be enforced with court fees and fines and, in some circumstances, jail time. So then there becomes a much more stringent punishment where the court is the one enforcing it and not Johnny Depp and his legal team. And that puts Amber Heard in a much different position in having to deal with an angry judge and not having to deal with Ben Chu and Camille Vasquez. Before we get into the different clips of this interview that I want to point out specifically, we need to thank our sponsor, Quip. Well, summer travel season is upon us. And one of the things that's important to me so I feel comfortable away from home is making sure I have my favorite electric toothbrush with me. I cannot go back to just a manual toothbrush. And it's so funny. I was just traveling with a friend for Dave Matthews. And what did I see neatly tucked away into her toiletry bag too, but her Quip toothbrush. It's so easy to travel with. It has a convenient cover. It's a lightweight. The batteries absolutely last. So you don't have to worry about one more charger. That's just for the one thing that you're probably going to forget. And then you're going to be mad when it doesn't work. The battery life on these toothbrushes is great. So a smart electric toothbrush that works for both kids and adults is easy to travel with and makes your routine so much simpler. The Quip toothbrush has timed sonic vibrations in 30 second pulses. So you make sure to get each quadrant of your mouth. It's lightweight, multi-use travel case that doubles as a mirror and a mount. And the reusable handles are metal and come in all kinds of fantastic colors. So if you are ready to improve your routine and get a toothbrush that not only will you love, but will be easy to take with you everywhere because we hate finding our favorites and then not being able to take it with us, go check out Quip. If you go to getquip.com slash Emily show right now, you'll get your first refill free. Oh yeah. They send them to your house. That's your first refill free at getquip.com slash Emily show spelled G E T Q U I P dot com slash Emily show quip the good habits company. Let's get back to today's show. I will say one of the interesting things in watching the Dateline interview versus the kind of teasers that were released is the Dateline interview did go further to try to portray Amber Heard in a sympathetic light, or at least shame the public for the way that they consumed this trial. They had a fairly brief clip of a opinion columnist, Michelle Goldberg, who also is a contributor to MSNBC, where Michelle Goldberg called the um, consumption really of this trial a medieval orgy of hatred and referred to it as misogynist mob behavior. And I've seen that talking point a lot with the way this trial was uh, consumed. And I think there was some, absolutely some misogyny in how Amber Heard was treated on social media, but not all of it. And I think trying to lump everything together is a way to try to either shame or discredit those who looked at her testimony and rightfully said, this doesn't match. The evidence in the testimony don't match here. And I don't understand why the media narrative is still that anyone who questions Amber Heard must be engaged in misogynist, you know, mob behavior. The public watched a trial, a very public trial, and the evidence at that trial shows that the things Amber Heard testified to were not supported by anything. In fact, there were large parts of her testimony contradicted by her own witnesses, and that was difficult. And while Amber Heard's trying to downplay little things like pledged versus donated, they aren't little things. And I went through the jury instruction multiple times about credibility of witnesses, but the jury is given an instruction that says, if you find a witness has lied about something, you can choose what, if not all of their testimony to discount. So a lie, not a, oh, I thought it was Tuesday. It's really a Wednesday. My bad. A lie. And when we get to pledged versus donated, 
which is Amber Heard um, saying that she donated all of her divorce settlement. That is not an oopsie. That is a lie. So with that, we are going to look at the way that pledged versus donated was discussed in the teaser clips because it's very different than the way it was discussed in the Dateline segment. So this clip is from the teaser trailer that was released talking about Amber Heard's pledged versus donated that she testified to on the stand where she said she used the term synonymously, that she had in fact donated um, $7 million to Children's Hospital Los Angeles and the ACLU when in fact she had paid very little of that. The juror that spoke out said that this part of the trial was a fiasco for Amber Heard, but it was a very big misrepresentation and Savannah Guthrie asks her about that here. You had promised to donate the seven million dollars of your divorce settlement to charity. It was revealed at trial that you haven't done so yet. However, they played a tape where you stayed on the air that you have donated it. Do you think that raised questions as to your credibility with the jury? It did. I made a, a pledge and that pledge is made over time by its nature. And when you say I donated, you know that everybody thinks that you've donated it, not that you've pledged it. So for the jurors sitting there, do you think they felt like that was you getting caught in a lie? I, I don't know because so much of the, I feel like so much of the trial was meant to cast aspersions on who I am as a human, yes. my credibility, to Your call me a liar in, in every way you can. And, and the thing is, this is a trial where it is your word versus Johnny Depp's word. So questioning your character is kind of the key of this trial and a central part of why this trial was different from the UK. In the UK, she was a witness. So her credibility was not questioned in the same way that it was here. So yes, that is a central part of the trial. And that was the trial. It was a credibility contest. And that I was it. This is another one of the examples where if you pull back and you think about it, I shouldn't have to have donated it in an in, in effort to be believed. I shouldn't have had to earmark the entirety of that in order to have. You uh, shouldn't have. But and this is the interesting thing for me. Amber Heard says I shouldn't have had to donate or earmark this money to be believed. So. Though it was widely speculated about, it is now clearly answered that Amber Heard donated this money not because she wanted nothing, as she said on Dutch TV, but because she wanted to be believed. And she said, I shouldn't have had to do this. So this clip does not make it into the full Dateline interview, but I think it is very, very telling. And we're going to listen to it just real quick again, because I think it is critical that we now know Amber Heard's motivations because she said, I shouldn't have even had to do that anyway. Back and you think about it, I shouldn't have to have donated it in an in, in effort to be believed. I shouldn't have had to earmark the entirety of that in order to have. You uh, shouldn't have. I shouldn't have had to have donated it in an effort to be believed. So when she was cross-examined and asked about whether or not she donated it in an effort to have better PR, she said in this interview, in fact, that she did. In the Dateline interview, instead of going into, I shouldn't have had to donate it in an effort to be believed, what she did was bring up this ridiculous house analogy again. And I have so many thoughts about this. I'm going to try to get them out in a succinct way because this is supposed to be a summary. But she brought this up at trial on cross-examination and she I think she must have thought it was a serve then because she brought it back up again here saying, you know, it's like when you buy a house. Amber Heard said to Savannah Guthrie, are you lying because you have not paid for it in full at the time? Girl, no. Here's the thing. In the house analogy, the home seller is analogous to the charity. And I don't think Amber Heard has ever bought or sold a property, clearly, um, or even maybe a vehicle, but the home seller is analogous to the charity. And when you buy a house, 
the seller gets all of the money. I mean, asterisks, there are limited circumstances where the seller floats a mortgage. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the traditional um, substantive way of selling a house. Yes, there are exceptions to everything. I am a lawyer. You know, mileage may vary. But in the broad circumstance, the seller of the property gets all of the money for the property, less fees and commissions. But the charity here never got the full amount of the money. It is the mortgage lender that you pay over time. The middle, the middle man, the middle money person is, is the middle money bank is who holds the mortgage and the house is collateral, but the person selling the house gets all the money. Here, the charities didn't get all the money. This, ana- this analogy makes literally no sense because you're not lying that you bought a house. You bought a house. You still have a mortgage on the house, but the seller of the house got the money. So the charities would need to have gotten the money. It would have been, the analogy would have worked is if, you know, Elon Musk had floated the 7 million and she was paying him over time because then the charity gets the full amount of money and she's paying a lender. That's not what happened here. It is a stupid analogy and it made me mad every single time. But then Savannah Guthrie did say, you're splitting hairs a bit there. And it's true because she keeps trying to make fetch happen with pledged versus donated. Donated means you paid it. Donated means the money is not in your pocket. Pledged means you're paying it over time. Camille Vasquez pointed out in this trial something that I had not put together because I just watched this trial and wasn't investigating this case behind the scenes. I was just watching the trial. Amber Heard's divorce settlement was paid to her in full over a year before Johnny Depp sued her. So she kept trying to say that the reason she didn't make good on her pledges is because she was sued. So either she is clairvoyant and knew that this lawsuit was coming a year before the lawsuit came. And the lawsuit, by the way, came just a matter of months after the op-ed was written. So she was paid in full months and months and months before the op-ed was written. She was paid in full in February, I believe, and the op-ed was written in December. So unless she was clairvoyant and knew she was going to get sued a year plus down the road, then how in the world did it not get paid? Because she had all of the money then. Pledged versus donated was a big deal because it showed that she was lying and she was caught in a very big lie. And Savannah Guthrie asks her about it and she said, no, this isn't a big lie. These, essentially these people just don't understand how these things work. These are next level rich people problems and you don't understand how this works. It's like buying a house. It's not like buying a house. But that's not the most interesting thing that happened here because we also have this segment that was completely edited and things were left out. And the edited parts are two things. One that the internet's been talking about a lot and one that I haven't seen talked about much at all. I'm going to play the teaser clip first and then I'm going to play the audio from the Dateline um, NBC aired version. But here's what happens. They are talking about whether or not Amber Heard instigated violence and talking about the clips Amber Heard's asked if she instigated violence directly by Savannah Guthrie. And she said, I never had to instigate it. I was always reacting. And Savannah Guthrie says, I'm looking at a transcript quote. He says, you start physical fights and you say, I did start a physical fight, but I, I can't promise you I won't get physical again. I mean, this is in black and white. I understand context. Savannah goes on to say, but you're testifying and you're telling me today, I never started a physical fight. And here you are saying that you did. And then Amber Heard goes on to talk about that dynamic and then says, when you're in an abusive dynamic, psychological, emotional, physically, you don't have the resources that say you or I do with the luxury of saying, hey, this is black and white. And that whole thing makes more context with Savannah Guthrie saying, I mean, this is black and white and I understand context. But when this goes to air, the part about, um, I can't promise you, I won't get physical again is cut out. Savannah Guthrie saying, I understand context is cut out. Savannah Guthrie saying, but you're testifying is cut out mid sentence. Cause it only says you're telling me today. 
And Amber Heard saying, you don't have the resources that say you or I do is cut out. So it just says, you don't have the luxury of saying this is black or white, making a completely different sentence with this Franken edit. Because when she says, you don't have the resources that say you or I do, it's very clear that Amber Heard is talking about survivors of domestic abuse not having resources and excluding herself and Savannah Guthrie from that conversation, which I think is exactly why they clipped it out. Because when this teaser dropped, myself and everyone else who does commentary was like, wait, you just said you're not in this dynamic. You just said you and Savannah Guthrie are excluded from this dynamic. And that was a very telling sentence that then got edited, fixed, altered, changed. And I don't know why it got changed, but so much got changed in this kind of couplet that it's very interesting to me. The comment about testifying came out. The comment where Amber Heard says, I did start a physical fight is in, but the I can't promise you I won't get physical again came out. Savannah Guthrie kind of saying, no, I understand context is out. Why is so much taken out here? I want to know your thoughts. So let's listen to these two back to back. And I I just, the thing speaks for itself. At this point, it's racist with low quitter. So first I'm playing the teaser clip from today's website. And then we will listen to the audio from the aired Peacock interview. But I am looking at a transcript that says, he says, you start physical fights and you say, I did start a physical fight. I can't promise you I won't get physical again. I mean, this is in black and white. I understand context, but you're testifying and you're just telling me today, I never started a physical fight. And here you are on tape saying you did. As I testified on the stand about this, is that when your life is at risk, not only will you take the blame for things that you shouldn't take the blame for, but when you're in an abusive dynamic, psychologically, emotionally, and physically, you don't have the resources that say you or I do with the luxury of saying, hey, this is black and white, because it's anything but when you're living in it. But then there are other times, there's another tape where- Listen to this follow-up from Savannah Guthrie where she says there's another tape, because in the interview we're going to listen to, it just jumps to, he says he never hit you, and this entire next segment is cut out of the Dateline interview. You're taunting him and saying, oh, tell the world, Johnny Depp, I, a man, the victim of domestic violence. 20 second clips or the transcripts of them are not representative of even the two hours or the three hours that those clips are excerpt from. Could your side have just put the whole three hours in then? Savannah Guthrie asked the important question, but what is not accounted for here is that that's exactly what happened. The entirety of these tapes, based on what the attorneys were saying in court and how the judge was ruling it, were in. The The attorney said to the court, we're playing from timestamp here to timestamp here. The entirety is in evidence. So yes, they are in evidence. And I wonder if that's why these segments were cut out. But Tell the World, Johnny Depp, was a very big audio clip for most who listen to this trial. But Savannah Guthrie asking about it does not make it into the final Dateline interview. I'm not a lawyer. As I testified to, I was talking in those recordings as a person, an extreme amount of emotional, psychological, and physical distress. He and says he doesn't never hit you. And that's where the interview that aired on Dateline picks up. All of the, you're taunting him saying, tell the world Johnny Depp is all clipped out. So now let's listen to the audio from Dateline. But I am looking at a transcript that says, he says, you start physical fights and you say, I did start a physical fight. I did start a physical fight. Yeah, you did. But you're just telling me today, I never started a physical fight. And here you are on tape saying you did. But you're telling me today, you never started a physical fight. What is cut out is, I can't promise you I won't get physical again. And Savannah Guthrie saying, I mean, this is in black and white. I understand context, but you're testifying and you're telling me today I never started a physical fight. And then listen to 
Amber Heard's answer. This cuts out the don't have the resources you or I do and then cuts out the but you're on tape taunting him. As I testified on the stand about this, is that when your life is at risk, not only will you take the blame for things that you shouldn't take the blame for, but when you're in an abusive dynamic psychologically, emotionally, and physically, you don't have the luxury of saying, hey, this is black and white, because it's anything but when you're living in it. He says he never hit you. Never. Is that a lie? Yes, it is. That edit is made in a way that is so smooth that if I hadn't commented on the resources that you or I do so much when I went over and gave commentary on the teaser clips, I would not have even perceived that there was a cut there, which has made me question everything I know, because we hear this from Real Housewives all the time. The edit changed this and the edit changed that. And even in motions from Jen Shaw, the Jen Shaw had um, an entire motion talking about Franken edits where it makes sentences say different things. And it's like, right, but generally when there's an edit, you can tell. I could not tell other than the fact that I had heard the previous clip. So I know for me, it will absolutely change my perception of interviews like this. But also it's made me so much more empathetic to all of the housewives that said, no, that sentence isn't how I said it. it things get edited down. That sentence was said with such fluidity. It said, you know, you don't have the luxury of saying this is black and white versus you don't have the resources that say you or I do with the luxury of saying, hey, this is in black and white. It's wild to me. Um, and I wonder how it went down that those sentences were changed. Because again, I understand having things in your preview or the teasers that don't make it into the real um, or the the real, I shouldn't say the real, but the full one hour special, I understand having more in the hour special than you had in the teasers. So it feels like there's a reason to watch everything. I don't understand clipping mid sentence because it feels like there's an acknowledgement there that that statement where Amber Heard's excluding herself from a group of people dealing with domestic violence is a huge tell for whether or not she was dealing with this after a jury found that her testimony was not believable. And I think that's why it got clipped out, but that's just my speculation. I very much want to know what you think about that. Other things that I noticed that were missing from this interview that were in the teasers was a segment when Amber Heard's talking about the truth and She's talking about the First Amendment and her right to speak the truth. And Savannah Guthrie questions her on it. And I think Savannah Guthrie asked fair questions and sometimes pointed questions in a kind way to not completely shut it down. But she was asking her about the truth. And Amber Heard said, and that's all I spoke. I spoke it being truth to power and paid the price. That all came out. I thought that that section, I spoke it to power and paid the price also is kind of in that defamation by implication realm of where she's saying, I spoke up against domestic, <laughs> I spoke up against sexual violence and paid the price. It was very similar to the headline from the op-ed that again was found to be defamatory. And I wonder why, or I wonder if that's why that was clipped out. There was also a clip of where Amber Heard was talking about the signs that were um, along the road when she was going to court for four, six city blocks. That's all clipped out to just be, you know, for blocks and things like burn the witch and death to Amber. It just says things I can't say on TV. But again, these were very specific signs. There are people I know that were at this trial that would have commented if they had seen those types of signs. There was media looking at the, the, things going on outside of the courtroom and commenting on it, commenting on the alpacas and people holding things in support of Johnny Depp and dressed up as Captain Jack Sparrow. There was lots of comment on it. But with the way I've seen the headlines be reported that this whole trial became kind of a spectacle, I can only imagine that if there were signs that were that negative and threatening to Amber Heard, we would have seen photos of them, comments of them, someone pointing them out because the mainstream media um, was pointing out how 
invasive some of the things going on around this trial felt and that it was an orgy of medieval hatred. And if you're, if that is your perception of the case, wouldn't you show that if that's happening? So it's interesting that the specificity of there were signs saying things like burn the witch and death to Amber was reported nowhere. There's no other evidence of that. There was also a segment where Amber Heard talks about one of the moments of levity from this trial, where she says that she believed Depp's attorneys were implying that she was using the op-ed to bolster the publicity for Aquaman. And that is just not what I heard in that segment of cross-examination. In that segment of cross-examination, what I remember is that Amber Heard's being asked if she's using the op-ed and the movie to bolster her own public profile, to raise her public profile because the movie will pull up the op-ed. And we heard from the ACLU that the op-ed was strategized for maximum impact. So the movie coming out raises attention around Amber Heard and then releasing the op-ed continues to raise attention around Amber Heard because the attention is already raised around the movie. But she still thinks that she was being asked about whether she was trying to use the op-ed to raise awareness of Aquaman. And she says, no, it's the other way around. It's just the opposite. And that is actually agreeing with Johnny Depp's team asking her, weren't you using the op-ed and the timing of it to coincide with the movie to raise your own public profile and awareness about you and awareness about the op-ed? And so now we've come to a point of agreement, which was a moment of levity for me in this interview, that we've all actually come to a point of agreement where Amber Heard agrees that it is the other way around. The movie gave the awareness to release the op-ed at a strategic time where there would be maximum impact and raise her public profile as well. And that, again, was all clipped out. But the final moment of levity from this is probably the thing that is, uh, you know, there were many memes from the trial, but now memes from the, now memes from the interview, and this is one of them. Amber Heard is going to be asked about cross-examination and the theme of the case for Team Depp. The theme of the case for Team Depp from opening statement was Amber Heard's playing the role of a lifetime in this trial. And we even saw it in the PR statements before the court took a week long break. The theme from Amber Heard's team was that Johnny Depp was an obsessed ex spouse hell bent on revenge. Depp's team was she's playing the role of a lifetime. And Savannah Guthrie asks her about it. In the closing arguments, the Depp lawyer said, called your testimony the performance of a lifetime and said you were acting. They did say that. What do you say to that? Says the lawyer for the man who convinced the world he had scissors for fingers. Mm. I'm the performer. I had listened to weeks of testimony. Uh, so this became kind of the the memeable moment from the teaser, and it actually did make it into the full interview. And what I walked away with from this interview is that, again, Amber Heard wanted to characterize Johnny Depp as a character. She said she looked out into the courtroom with fans of Captain Jack Sparrow. When asked about the attorneys saying that her testimony was a performance of a lifetime, what she didn't answer with was, that's appalling. I am a victim of horrific domestic abuse to say that it's an act diminishes everything. It's not an act. It's what I lived or something like that. Instead, what she said is, Oh yeah. Says the lawyer for the man who has scissors for, or who convinced the world that he has scissors or fingers. So not only am I now convinced that Amber Heard does not know how buying property works, but I also wonder if she doesn't know how acting works because no one was surprised that after Edward Scissorhands came out that Johnny Depp wasn't walking around with actual scissor hands. No one, no one was surprised. And then she goes on to say in this interview clip and in the main interview 
I heard weeks about what a bad actress I was, and yet they're saying it's the performance of a lifetime. They didn't say it was convincing, and the jury didn't find that it was convincing. But you could have responded about the experience of testifying and how hard it was, and that this wasn't a performance, that this was your truth. And she didn't. Instead, she tried to say that somehow the lawyers were representing a man that convinced the world that he literally has scissors for fingers. And it was the strangest answer in this entire interview. And I'm actually glad it stayed in because it shows again that she didn't respond, that she wasn't acting. She responded that the lawyer represented perhaps a better actor because if Johnny Depp did in fact convince the world that he has scissors for fingers, then, you know, that is quite a feat. Most people watch a movie and are like, oh, that's a movie. I can't wait to hear what you think about what was left in of this interview and what was taken out of this interview. And I will say, normally it is my general position that when you are in litigation, out of litigation, that speaking is tenuous. We haven't seen a statement from Johnny Depp, but the interviews weren't the end. We have seen statements from both teams' spokespersons. After the interview, Depp's team's spokesperson told NBC News, quote, it's unfortunate that while Johnny is looking to move forward with his life, the defendant and her team are back to repeating, reimagining, and relitigating matters that have already been decided by a court and a verdict that was unanimously and unequivocally decided by a jury in Johnny's favor. And of course, to not allow Team Depp to have the last word, Amber Heard's team responded to the post, quote, if Mr. Depp or his team have a problem with this, notice they don't refer to what this is, if Mr. Depp and his team have a problem with this, we recommend that Johnny himself sit down with Savannah Guthrie for an hour and answer all her questions. Johnny Depp sat down on the stand for days and days and answered questions and answered Heard's attorney's questions. Amber Heard testified for over five days. This played out in court. The lawyers all made statements after trial, and it could have stopped there. Amber Heard said in court multiple times, I want him to leave me alone, and I want to move on. It seems that Johnny Depp, other than a brief statement on Instagram after the verdict, Amber Heard also made one on Instagram and Twitter after the verdict, He has not spoken about this at all. Amber Heard has. And it's interesting to me that that's happening. But there is a way to speak after a verdict. And I I think that there is something to be learned from the way the Chrisleys addressed it after their federal convictions. Their podcast returned last week on Tuesday or Wednesday. And they very briefly addressed it by saying, our, you know, our life has changed We are going to keep doing the podcast as long as we can. After, when we no longer can do the podcast, then it will be handed over to our kids. They thanked their supporters for their support and prayers and talked about the kindness that they've been shown since the conviction, said that they would be appealing it, and said that they are leaning into their faith, and then talked about their lives and moved on and said, this is what we're going to continue to do on the podcast. We're not going to talk about this anymore. They addressed it briefly from their own perspective. They did not throw the jury under the bus, lawyers under the bus, witnesses under the bus. They just said, this has been our experience. Thank you for your support. We're going to keep doing the podcast as long as we can and moved on. I think if you're going to make a statement after a conviction, the Chrisleys made a good one and it's rare to see. So with that, there is a juxtaposition. You don't have to do an NBC News sit down, but that's what Amber Heard chose to do. And I don't think it helped her. And I want to know what you think. So we're going to have that discussion in the Law Nerds group over on Patreon at lawnerdsunite.com. When I post this episode, we can have a conversation under that. And we will be having conversations about this around social media, because this is one where I really, 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 I say it every week, but I really want to know your thoughts. And to take a note from the Chrisleys, I also have my own thank yous to say. For all of you that are supporting this podcast, I see you. We are again 
at the top of the U.S. entertainment news charts, but we're also topping in top 100 at number 81 in the U.S. news charts. But that's also true in Great Britain, in Canada, Australia, Germany, France, Sweden, Spain, Brazil, Russia, Mexico, Norway, Ireland, Denmark, the Netherlands, New Zealand. Thank you. This podcast, when I say charts in more than 50 countries, it charts in more than 50 countries, both in the news category and entertainment news category. And I appreciate your support so much. And it's wonderful because I get to see the reviews internationally, even though a lot of you, when you go into like Apple, only get to see them in your own location. So for sunny days in the U.S., for Daisy Bethan in Great Britain, for Fashion Maven 123 in France, and Pixel Ate It <laughs> in the U.S., thank you, thank you, thank you for your recent reviews. They are tremendously kind, and I appreciate you, and I do see your reviews. So if you want to leave a review of the podcast, I will see it. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you for being law nerds. I, I'm really, I just want this episode to be out so we can talk about it. That's it. I just want to talk about it. So with that, it is time to say goodbye. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being a law nerd. May your Wi-Fi be strong. May your toilet paper and, you know, tampons be plentiful because that was the supply chain issue I was not expecting at all. I was not expecting that to be an issue at all. So may they be plentiful. You know, may your gas not be $8 a gallon. May your families be well, and may the odds be ever in your favor. I will see you in the next one. Connect with me everywhere. I'm at the Emily D Baker. If you guys want to join the text, just text emily.com. If you want to join the channel, lawnerdsunite.com. Happy to have you support what we do here on the YouTube.